Welcome to the Arsenic Theory channel. Uh, today I wanted to discuss with you one book. Uh, it's called The Next Million Years. Uh, it was written by Charles Galton Darwin. And so one of the books that had changed my understanding of how the world works and also, I would like to say, busted a lot of um, traps I was in, right? The traps or that you know the traps that can be called conspiracy theories. I was in one of those traps, and this book shed a lot of light and explained to me how you know the world works. So it was written. It's called the Next Million Years. Uh, Charles Galton Darwin. For those of you who don't know, he was a grandson of Charles Darwin. You know the the Charlie Darwin that wrote The Origin of Species. Uh, that you know many of you have heard in your biology classes. Uh, he was also, uh, you know, he related to uh, the f fa such families such as Huxleys and Keynes and Barlow's. All of those were very influential in their scientific communities back in 19th and 20th centuries. Obviously, you know Aldous Huxley, as many of you know, wrote The Brave New World. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk about this book in particular, this book is short and concise and something that you cannot find in any library. In fact, Amazon and on eBay, you probably either A, cannot find it or B, it's going to be, you know, over two, three hundred bucks. I have actually the first edition here, so it's in a very good shape, as you can see. Uh, also, Charles Galton Darwin was a world's leading physicist, it says over here. I believe he's the one that worked on the Manhattan Project, you know, the one that created the atomic bomb in America. And uh, he's a you know pioneer of nuclear studies, a frequent lecturer in American universities. So not a small potato for sure. So let's start reading this book. So let me get rid of the cover over here so I don't soil it further and destroy it. The next million years. And I actually had decided to read this book, you know, from cover to cover here on the show. And the reason I wanted to do that because it's not long and every word has a meaning. When anyone starts to write on a subject at which he has since I very much wanted to write it, the only alternative seemed to be to give up the idea of elaborate preparatory reading and to make use from memory of a very considerable amount of unsystematic reading and thinking on the subject. A book written in this way can of course make no claim to the sort of authority that might be given to one which was based on exhaustive preliminary studies. One common theme that can be drawn in regards to conspiracy theories is the following. Great many of them believe that there is a cabal of very wise men that is operating on the top of the food chain and they make all the rules, make all the laws and they condition the populations below them to the agenda that they see fit. And they are bound together by a common agenda, wherever it might be. Some might say it's a world domination, others believe that it is to harness our you know creative and you know other energies what all of them fail to say is that who those personas are who is this cabal of the wise man who are these 300 families or so a thousand families nowadays that control your fate and the fate of the entire universe. That's something that I have been struggling to find. Is that really true? Is there truly people on the very top that decide our very lives? That's why I picked up this book to understand further what this cabal is all about. And if it, even if it doesn't even exist, should I worry about it? Every day I look uh, and observe the behavior of people. Many of them do behave in a common manner. 
many of them do hold uh, trendy ideas, the beliefs that are in current, so to speak. They do flow with the current. Like a leaf that falls from the tree and lands on a, a river. And it, the current picks it up and carries it wherever, it wherever it pleases. And the leaf just lays there on the water and is carried and has no thinking of its own. That's how most people are when they float through their day. They do not think about where their beliefs come from. Why do they believe in these things? Why does their conscious, even their gut, tells them uh, what, uh, how to behave next, how to respond to situations, and what to make out of the things that take place around them? I, on the other hand, and many independent thinkers too, we try to not only understand how it works, but why it works. And is there a man behind the curtain that pulling the strings like in the Wizard of Oz? The problem is, even with the independent thinkers and people that you know, try to think for themselves, there are a lot of traps out there too. Uh, you know, one of them is what we had come to term as conspiracy theories. There are many traps like that. Obviously, there are conspiracies, right? I mean, uh, the US government had declassified a lot of documents. And we know that, you know, they have been conducting experiments on people, uh, such as through MK Ultra. We know that, you know, the CIA was responsible for setting up uh, pretty much every single kingdom in the Middle East and that they have been toppling governments and overthrowing regimes, assassinating leaders or attempting to do that in Cuba and, like I said, Middle East. And that's something that has been already, uh, you know, publicly known. Uh, many think tanks, such as Council on Foreign Relations, have been publishing books in regards to CIA being the kingmakers in the Middle East. We know that uh, the Manhattan Project was kept secret for a long time and thousands of people were involved. We know that there are, you know, secret DARPA, right, programs of the Department of Defense and what they do. And we find out about it 10, 20, 30 years after they come into fruition. But are these really conspiracies or are they just simply government trying to protect certain um, certain things from other governments to know. Is it just, you know, the uh, things of national security? That's why they keep them secret? Uh, every government has its secrets, right? Every government tries to protect itself from the invasion or from uh, deliberate manipulation. But my question is, is it truly a cabal of families or some kind of super race that existed since time immemorial, maybe since the time when the first glaciers have melted after the ice age and those people appeared from the ground or came down from the mountains and they possess some kind of secret knowledge of how to manipulate the masses, how to manage people, and they were very successful at uh, seeing, uh, at picking up the remnants of people and molding them over millennia into the mass of people, into the slaves that they want us to become. I don't know. I don't think so. At least I haven't seen the evidence for that. As far as, you know, conditioning is concerned and, you know, uh, obviously we see that uh, mass media especially, they always are in trend. They always are telling you the news or analysis or give you facts. And there is some kind of belief system that they have, you know, whatever it might be, liberal, progressive, or whatever you call it. Obviously, they are following some kind of template when they tell you certain news because they will never tell you something that is not kosher or politically incorrect. And we see that every day. So, 
do they receive some kind of agenda or what to say and what not to say or do they have some kind of self-censorship where they know i'm not going to talk about the subject in fear of being uh, reprimanded in fear of being going out of business or you know uh, in in fear of getting uh, harassed by the public or is it simply can be explained by sociology that a small group of people always you know decides the fate of uh you know the larger whole you know such as you know only what is it one or few two percent of um you know uh, people participated in the actual american revolution uh, and you know that gave constitution that gave the bill of rights etc you know majority of people did not participate right I mean, they were entangled in the war, entangled in the revolution when it started happening, but majority of them were not involved. And you can see that in every country, for example, in Russia, right? Uh, only a handful of people uh, overthrew the Tsarist regime and installed a Bolshevik, um, you know, a new Bolshevik system. And the rest of the peasants, they were just sitting there in their small little houses and their log homes, uh, milking the cow, cutting the potatoes, and um, you know, uh, gossiping about each, each other neighbors, right? They were not involved in the revolution. So let's start with introduction. Anyone who attempts to predict the history of the next 10 years is a rash man. And if he attempts to make his forecast for a century, he is very properly regarded as so foolhardy as not to be worth listening to at all. Um, as, as you might remember in my last book review that I did on a, a Brief History of the Future by Jax Atali, he also mentions that there is some kind of uh, historical trend that has been taking place since the advent of globalization and that no one was able to reverse it. I think that's what he's getting here as well. It is certainly not possible to predict anything like a detailed history of the world, but nevertheless it is now possible to foresee a good deal of what I may call its average history. One of the things also that came to my mind is, you know, uh, obviously I had mentioned the book by Jack Satali, Brief, Brief History of the Future. I had mentioned, um, you know, another one written by a scientist about the year 2055 and now this one next million years. Uh, in the times of old, and as you probably know from your, you know, Greek mythology classes or religion classes or whatnot, that there were oracles. And many rulers and generals and people of high, higher caliber in a society came to them to ask for advice. Um, most of them were living remotely, uh, some were in the mountains, some of them were ha had their altars or their oracles right in the palaces, in the royal places, or in, 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 inside the temples, etc. Could it be that these oracles were just high-ranking advisors? Could it be that these oracles did not uh, have a crystal ball, but simply were in the know, in a sense, that they were always at the court talking to different people, listening to high-end uh, conversations, uh, meeting with uh, you know, generals and rulers and uh, princes and so forth. So obviously a lot of information, a lot of pertinent and uh, I would like to say clandestine information was going through their ears. So they were able, if they were smart enough, obviously, they were able to assess that and come up with reasonable forecasting situations. For instance, if they always hear about, um, you know, some nation gathering up troops and getting resources and increasing their uh, trade to, uh, to get more ore or to get more, um, you know, weapons, etc., they were able to uh, tell with high certainty that this nation is going to attack us in the next five to ten years and we should prepare. Or, you know, this king, uh, you know, should, uh, should marry this woman 
because she is of a descent of some other nation that is going to become our enemy soon because we know the manipulations and trickery that they have been pulling off behind uh, behind our backs. So maybe all these oracles were just, you know, advisors, nothing more. No magic, no crystal ball, just simply advisors, smart people, such as we had, you know, in the United States here at the Jimmy Carter administration, there was Big New Brzezinski. At uh, Richard Nixon's administration, there was uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Brent Scarcroft, um, Mandel House at the Woodrow Wilson's administration. All these high-ranking, high-caliber advisors uh, that were able to, you want to say, move pieces of chess on the chessboard, right? But they were able to do that, moving all these pawns on the chessboard. But they were able to do that. Why? Because are they some kind of aliens or some kind of chubacabras hiding in the human flesh? No, because they're just bright individuals who are able to uh, see beyond, uh, who, who truly gave their lives to that service and who truly were thinking about these kind of things every day and were able to give, you know, reasonable, good advice and they're influential about it. Just look at the speeches given by Zbigniew Brzezinski and his advice and his you know, conference and so forth. He remained lucid and sharp all the way through his you know, advanced years when he was what over 80 years old. He was still at the conferences speaking on a subject, giving advice, arguing, being funny. These are the kind of people that obviously will be at the higher echelons of power advising people. These are the modern day oracles. As the number of chances becomes larger and larger, the effects of each single event becomes less and less important, and they tend to cancel out. The probability that they will all go one way becomes quite negligible, so that something approximating with great accuracy towards the average is the final, practically inevitable consequence. So what he talks about here is the law of large numbers. Just to give a quick example, um, every human being on Earth, taking on an individual basis, can be said to be very unpredictable. We don't know what kind of actions, what steps that human being will take at any given point. That's why we say human actions or human beings are generally unpredictable. However, if you take all of the humans combined, all billions of them, and you take their actions and you put them on the graph somewhere, you will start to see that there is an averages that will appear, so-called the law of large numbers. The more people you have, the more average their behavior seems when you put it all in one place and look at it in a graph format. The operation of the laws of probability should tend to produce something like certainty. We may, so to speak, reasonably hope to find the Boyle's law, which controls the behavior of those very complicated molecules, the members of the human race. And from this, we should be able to predict something of man's future. We see for all, all of those global warming believers and believers in climate change, it is true. The climate does change, and that's something that I can get into on my next talk, where I uh, show you different scientific white papers and scientific studies indicating that the climate does change. However, it has been changing for millions of years. And to say that, you know, this current climate change, change is anthropogenic, meaning human-induced or produced, is too soon. Maybe we can do that in the next, uh, uh, in a million year retrospect. Unfortunately, some, some will say we don't have that time, but at the same time, I don't want to change my lifestyle because of some beliefs that somebody else has. So let's continue. When I compare human beings to molecules, the reader may feel that this is a bad analogy because unlike a molecule, a man has free will 
which makes his actions unpredictable. This is far less important than might appear at first sight, as is witnessed by the very high degree of regularity that is shown by such things as the census returns. When averaged over a whole population, this reveal a remarkable degree of regularity in most of the happenings of life. So obviously for those that believe that they're totally unpredictable, that they're so unique, such wonderful human beings, you are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are a human being with infinite amount of variations within you. However, when taking on a large scale, the law of large numbers says that your behavior is predictable and pretty common, or as he says, with quite degree of regularity. Let's continue. For the next million years, we shall be concerned with the history governed by the same human nature as we know now, with all its virtues and all its faults. In a nutshell, what Charles Galton Darwin says is that for the past million years, looking at the geology, at the biology, at the evolution of the human being and species as a whole, we can say that man has not changed. And he says that looking further forward into the next million years, he thinks and he assumes that the human nature will not change as well and stay the same. Henceforth, you can, with this internal control, uh, characteristic, you can, na you can now make predictions into the future. Once again, the, uh, Charles Galton Darwin talks about fluctuations, meaning those unpredictable actions uh, and deeds that you know human being commits every day. And uh, there will be variations, there will be fluctuations. And let's not forget, he is writing this book right after World War II, the most devastating example in the recent human history where the entire fabric of the society had changed over the you know, five years that there has been war. And even then, he says that these are still fluctuations and they do not signify a complete derailment of the course of the human history. Because human actions, in their, when taken in their totality, on average, end up being uh, you know, very similar in nature. In the final chapter, I attempt a synthesis of all these things in the form of a forecast of the history of the future. It is divided into several subsections, each of which deals with one of the main aspects of human life. As you can see, Charles Galton Darwin uh, breaks down the aspects with which uh, of, 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 of his crystal ball into very distinct categories such as population and the social aspects of the human race. These are all, uh, for example, the population has been uh, talked by academia and intelligentsia of various countries, especially of Europe, since m the time of Malthus, the one who first proposed the idea that um, you know, there are limits to the population growth and that if population just runs amok without any kind of uh, controls, they will basically eat up the food supply and start dying off and end up in wars, civil strife and general chaos. I'm going to try to see what some of these laws of human thermodynamics are. Of course, they cannot be expected to have the same hard outline of the laws of physical science, but still I think some of them can be given a fairly definite form. So this concludes the first chapter. Uh, on the next chapter, I will delve into the population aspect of, uh, you know, the human forecasting. Thank you for staying tuned on the Arsenic Theory channel and more to come. So please subscribe, hit that bell button and don't forget to put the likes. Thank you again and have a great day.